On 28 February 1968, in Tamil Nadu, South India, 12 kilometers north of Puducherry, a new city was founded on a barren plateau. The founder, Mira Alfasa, known as the mother, called the future city Oroville. The mother invited to Oroville all those who thirst for progress and aspire for a truer and higher life. Oroville was conceived as a living laboratory where the integral yoga developed by Sri Aurobindo would be put into practice. The center of the future city would be the Matri Mandir, the shrine of the Universal Mother, a place for concentration and for developing in oneself a new consciousness. The Matri Mandir will be the soul of Oroville, said the mother in 1970, and the sooner it is there, the better it will be for everybody, especially for the Aurovillians. The mother chose Roger Angers as chief architect. He would commute between Paris and Auroville throughout the construction phase. The mother's vision concerned mainly the interior of the inner chamber and the inner skin. She also spoke with the architect Paolo Tomasi regarding help with the design. I suggest that is a, a round form. Mm, that moment the camera Roger, he suggests the other form, I think a pyramid. After, uh, I think uh, she spoke with uh, Roger, and uh, she said, uh, okay, it is a round form, it can be good. For the rest of the structure, she relied on the chief architect's proposals, but insisted on daily reports and took the final decisions. In her vision, the chamber will be a kind of hall, with 12 facets, 12 columns, and at the center on the floor, her symbol. And on it, the four symbols of Shirobindo joined together in a square holding a globe made of some transparent substance. The ray of sun will strike this globe. There would be an opening for the ray to enter. No windows, no pictures, no flowers, no religion. The hall would be air-conditioned, and on the floor a soft carpet would cover everything except the center. It would be a place for concentration and for trying to find one's consciousness. The construction of the Matra Mandir, located at the center of Oroville, at the geographical center of Oroville, is a necessity for the city. It is a necessity in the sense that it represents a connecting link between the inhabitants. It is difficult to compare it with the significance of the cathedral in earlier cities, because Oroville is not at all a new religion, so it cannot be a temple either. It is the expression of the faith of the inhabitants towards what represents the common ideal. At dawn, on the 21st of February 1971, the foundation stone of the Matrimandir was laid. It was the third element completing the center of Oroville, the model of which was presented for the first time on that day. The three elements are the banyan tree, the urn where the city was founded, and the future Matrimandir. Over the weeks and months that followed, a handful of Aurovillians, Ashramites and friends dug into that red earth on an area roughly marked as the excavation site for an immense crater, ten and a half meters deep and fifty meters across. Despite all their efforts, the work did not go quickly enough. And people started to seriously question whether those few Aurovillians could build the Matrimandir themselves. Piero, an architect from Italy, 
wrote a letter to mother after carrying out a detailed study of the work to be done. He concluded that the Orvillians could, for the time being, take upon themselves the responsibility for the excavation, the foundation and the four pillars. This first phase of the work could be completed by August the 15th, 1972. Labour was a very important problem. At that time, some 50 people lived in Oroville. To ensure a regularity of work, it would be necessary to rely on paid labour, while keeping some specific tasks, such as concreting, a priority for the Orovillians. The work was relatively simple. Piero had enough experience to assess that the work could be realised under his direction with the help of an engineer's office in Chennai. The proposal was approved by the mother. It was decided to hire Tamil labourers from the surrounding villages to speed up the process. Beginning in November 1971, around 400 labourers began removing the earth bit by bit. Earth moving equipment was suggested but rejected because of its inability to negotiate the steep incline as well as for its high cost. Besides, there was a general rejection of heavy machinery when it could be avoided. By February the 21st, 1972, the excavation was complete. 20,000 cubic meters of earth had been displaced. A stone was laid in the base of the east pillar, bearing in mother's handwriting the date, 21st of February 1972, the OM symbol, blessings and her signature. It was the symbolic beginning of the construction phase. Well, as I say, it's, it's, it's very simple. If, if Piro gives you a drawing and says, well, this size steel goes every 15 centimetres and this size steel comes the other way at every 20 centimetres, you don't have to be a genius to do that. <laughs> no? I mean, to design it, you might have to be, but to actually tie pieces of steel together in a network and pour the concrete in and vibrate it is experience. I mean, you learn as you go along. So we learned, I mean, for myself, I learned only the skills as an engineer that I needed in Machmandir. I didn't know anything else. We were in need to have labor for the night work and uh, so we were sending word around and uh, even from Pondi, we got such a, a beautiful response from that. Many people were coming at six o'clock you now when we started and uh, they were working until uh, one o'clock, two o'clock in the night and for this huge Concreting in the foundation, uh, the, the, the work was lasting many, many hours. Mm, Sometimes we got to maybe 100, 150 persons working with the spotlights and uh, cramping and down and uh, uh, running around with the wheelbarrows and, and so on. It was, it was a nice, it was a nice uh, atmosphere, full of enthusiasm. After finishing the footings, each of the four pillars was cast in four levels, two metres at a time. Concreting started on the east pillar, even as the shuttering for the next pillar was prepared, and this rhythm went on until all four pillars had reached ground level, a height of 8.64 metres above the foundation.
Then the first level slab was ready to be built, and the work on the summit of the four pillars began. And it so happened that uh, we, we cast it uh, just the last tip of the fourth pillar on the same day and the same hour when mother left her body. So it was uh, symbolically the completion of the four aspects of the mother that were casted into concrete. The first layers of the ribs, structurally supporting the sphere and the second level slab, were completed on the 29th of March, 1974. The next phase was on the work on the four cantilevered arm brackets joining the four pairs of ribs to the ring beam at the centre, more than 20 metres above the foundation. These brackets and this ring beam would later support the floor of the inner chamber. Preparations were made to join the ribs at the top of the sphere with a ring beam. On the 28th and 29th of May, 1976, the ring beam was concreted. This was to provide an opening for the sunbeam to enter the inner chamber and to strike the crystal as a single ray of light. On the 17th of November, 1976, Concreting of the floor of the inner chamber began and was finished after 29 hours. The chamber's 12-faceted wall was cast in sections over the next year. Concreting of the chamber roof began in February 1978, quarter by quarter, and was cast through numerous concretings over the next two months. In addition to the people working on the ground, some 50 people were present on the 160-ton roof when the final chetty of concrete was poured. It was a powerful and very special moment in Oroville's history. The next major stage was the installation of the ramps, which had been built in the metal workshop for over a period of 18 months. The ramps started from the second slab and spiralled upwards until they reached the inner chamber. Each ramp consisted of 10 sections measuring 5 metres in length and weighing up to 800 kilos. Once in place, they were double welded together. The two sections that passed through the pillars and the footings also had to be concreted into position. A big crane was now needed for the upcoming jobs on the construction site. A crane of this size was not available in India at that time. So one was designed and built in the Matrimandir workshop during 1979 to 1980. On September 13, 1980, everything was ready on top of the Matrimandir to install the new crane. A large scaffolding structure that stuck out four meters above the walls of the chamber had been erected to hoist up the large conical tower and the 20 meter boom and a 10 meter arm for the counterweight. The small tower was hoisted up through the three central rings of the structure. 
its two towers would fit into each other and would be supported by the top concrete ring. Lifting these elements up to the top was a major task, since all the parts had to be winched up by hand. The space frame that supports the skin of Matramandia is composed of a grid of prefabricated RCC beams of varying lengths, which were fixed together to give a shape to the sphere. It's the 1st of June today. The last beams will have been precast. Then they get a bath in this pool here for about three to four weeks. They will sit there until their predestined day to be hoisted up and cast in the right places. Four diagonal and two horizontal beams were welded together with a steel spiral. At the junction of these beams, a chicken mesh and plaster box was made. The purpose of this box was to act as a shuttering into which concrete could be poured. It was greatly encouraging to have almost reached the top with these beams, and the last horizontal beams were cast in situ. Fitting all 1,200 concrete beams took eight years, and was completed on the 15th of August 1987. A large circular slab covers the top between the last row of beams and the hole in the centre, the hole through which the ray of light enters the inner chamber. When the entire scaffolding was removed, the skin suddenly became a delicate framework of triangles. It was so beautiful, in fact, that when the architect next came to Auroville, he thought it would be a great pity to cover the entire sphere with a concrete skin. Rather, he was thinking of a transparent glass covering through which the back of the golden discs would be visible. The space frame urgently needed a protective covering against the heavy monsoon rains. The construction allowed for a double skin and there were many possible materials with which to cover the triangles, both from the inside and the outside. An important meeting took place on October 15, 1987. Yes, this is talking about how we covered the here. And it goes back to, I'm um, here I remember, uh, 15 years ago. Amalu's room, which is a white glass sphere, and he was talking about you know, the psychic qualities of the sunset against this glass thing. I mean, there's many visions that we can look into, but the problem is, as soon as we suggest... Different suggestions on how to close the space frames were made. These included covering it with marble slabs without discs, or the original design, using ferrocement triangles with golden discs outside and glass inside. Every proposal was passionately discussed over the years and finally it was decided to stick to the original design. This allowed the building of the skin to proceed in phases, thus keeping maximum flexibility in the construction schedule. Then we start the next phase, which is very exciting. It's to prepare the room for the crystal which is coming.
The marble you see was quarried in uh, Massa, Italy, and it came over in 1978. It remained here in storage in the amphitheater, right next to the Monte till about 1982, I think, when it was open just to be summarily checked. And at that time, they found that there had been an insect infestation. 30% of uh, the total 1,240 pieces that we have for the inner chamber wall. Fortunately, we found that using bleach over a period of time, from two days to maybe a week or so, we could solve this problem and clean out this nasty staining. The 1,200 pre-cut marble pieces were hoisted up into the inner chamber. The slabs were sorted by color to ensure that the various white shades flowed harmoniously in all 12 rows. Each 25 kg slab had to be carefully adjusted and checked and installed in place with stainless steel clamps and adhesive before the joints were grouted. Down below, the pillars were extended to provide for the staircases that would serve as the main access to the structure via each of the four pillars. There would be 25 steps in each pillar and these would eventually be clad with granite slabs. Once inside, a twin spiral staircase winds up from the first to the second level from where the twin ramps give access to the inner chamber. This was to be the last structural part of the construction. The whole weight of this staircase, some 90 tons, hangs in fact on level 2. On level 1, only the two lower landings of the staircase are joined to the main structure. A circular slab of white marble was engraved with the mother's symbol in the chamber itself. For easy handling, this was made in four quarters. A full-scale model of the crystal in the center gave an idea of how it might look one day. The four Shriabindo symbols that support the crystal were crafted in an Oroville workshop. The lotus part of the symbols was also being carved and polished. The last step before the final gold plating that would take place in Germany. The long-awaited columns, meant to stand inside the chamber, were delivered from Italy to Matri Mandir in 1990. Specially manufactured, these columns were made of seamless galvanized pipes. Immediately, the painstaking work of sanding and painting began to ensure the greatest quality and durability. Finely cut and angle slabs of the finest Rajasthani marble were laid on the floor in a star pattern. After a few months, all 12 columns, carefully wrapped in foam and plastic, were gently hauled up into the chamber and erected at their appointed places. A scaffolding was built to lift them up to the structure. Each column of 60 centimeters diameter and 8.64 meter in length weighed almost a ton. Wheeled to their places, they were winched up into position by hand. The column footings were round concrete bases cast into the floor which stuck out by 10 centimeters. The columns were securely anchored to these footings by means of a strong cable which was stretched up through the middle of each column and fixed to a metal brace welded into the top end. After a final polishing, the chamber was ready to receive its most precious item. Finally, the perfect sphere of pure crystal, intended to receive the ray of light, 
descending at the center of the inner chamber, got its last polishing at the Zeiss factory in Germany. Then it was here, on the morning of the 27th of April, 1991, it was hoisted up to the inner room of Matrimandia, inside its special container. The crystal, measuring 70 centimeters across and weighing 450 kilograms, is made of boar corn seven glass, purer than the purest natural crystal, the only one of its kind the largest glass crystal globe in the world. When the container was opened, there was a feeling that something momentous and profound had happened. Everyone crowded around the edge of the container, each one taking a turn to look down on the crystal marvel. The wonderful atmosphere of the room became even more marvelous. On the 15th of August, 1991, after the bonfire at 6.30 a.m., the inner chamber was opened for Aurevillians and visitors. Climbing up the steep 50-meter ramp, they entered a sanctuary of peace and beauty. The crystal was still in its crate, off to one side, since the symbol on which the globe was to rest had not arrived in time. A week later, the crystal was removed from the crate and mounted on top of a prototype model of the symbol for the initial test with the heliostat. Heliostat that will eventually sit on top of Matramandir and uh, track the sun to guide the solar ray down into the chamber onto the crystal in the meditation room. So we are now showing how the ray will be reflected. We adjust the secondary mirror in position. So that is the more or less position and uh, this actually is reflecting the sun that now in the morning will come from this side toward the fixed mirror and this will reflect it down from the hole in, on the top of the material to the globe. This uh, mirror will track the sun during the daily movement and uh, at uh, lower speed as what we are doing now, will follow the whole circle of the sun in the sky until sunset when uh, it's arriving low to the horizon. Finally, in February 1993, the gilded symbols to support the globe arrived on site. A few days later, they were installed in the chamber. A large number of Aurevillians were present. One year later, the carpet was laid. It had been woven in India using imported wool. This was the final element to be installed in the room, thus completing the inner chamber. Like an open lotus flower, the Matri Mandir will be surrounded by two rows of petals, 12 big and 12 small ones. The last big excavation work for the petals started in 1991 
around the construction site. The big petals rise from the edge of the promenade around the future lotus pond beneath the structure. From there they extend outward for 43 meters, rising sharply in a slope concentric to the sphere before gradually descending to ground level. Together with the small and earthen petals, they form the transition to the future inner gardens. Red agrostone covers the outside face of these petals as well as the surface of the small petals. Inside the sphere, the marble mosaic work on the first and second levels was in full swing. The benches on the first level where people would put on socks before going upstairs was almost finished. Workers from Rajasthan and Aurevillians laid the marble mosaic between the ribs. In the middle was a channel of inlaid gold, along which water will one day gently flow. The marble on the double conical staircase leading to the second level was also completed. The grouting was cleaned and after a final polishing, everything was covered with a protective cloth until the day the interior of the sphere would finally be ready. In August 1995, a team was formed to prepare the golden discs for the outer skin. The plan was to apply gold leaf to fiberglass reinforced polyester discs. It was expected that this phase of manufacturing the golden discs would go smoothly and quickly, and so it would have had it not been for the birds and bees. The first test showed that the birds had damaged the gold foil with their excrement and claws, so it was back to square one. New research work discovered an alternative a sandwich of golden glass tiles such as was used on the Golden Temple in Bangkok centuries ago. The technique had been lost and had to be rediscovered. First, the glass was cleaned and cut, like the gold leaf, into four square centimeter pieces. Next, the individual leaves were put between the two pieces of glass and vacuum sealed in an oven. The edges of each tile were ground and then they were glued onto the stainless steel discs. There were 18 sizes of tiles and between 1024 and 2400 trapezoidal tiles on each disc. The end row pieces had to be bent into shape and the space in between the tiles was grouted with yellow silicon. The first of the 1400 discs was mounted on top of the sphere on the 8th of January 1999. Stainless steel legs supported each disc at a distance of 60 centimeters from the surface of the sphere. Each disc had legs of slightly different lengths, depending on the points of attachment. Six for the small convex discs and nine for the big concave ones. The solid points of fixation for the legs were the bolts which protrude from the outer shell and anchor the legs to the discs. Each disc had to be manually held in place during fixation. At the same time, many people had to balance on the bolts to fix the nuts as quickly as possible. The big discs 
are between 2 meters 20 and 2 meters 40 in diameter and weigh 190 kilos, while the small ones measure 1 meter 30 and 1 meter 60 across and weigh 110 kilos. By August 2002, 1,024 discs had been put in place, with only some 380 more to go. The golden discs covered the sphere almost down to the top of the petals. One could begin to have a very good idea of what the completed matrimandir would look like. But in June 2004, a major setback occurred. The waterproofing layer on the outer skin had begun to peel off from the surface of the ferrous cement shell. The German manufacturer sent over its engineers and discovered after some tests that the company had supplied the wrong primer. Fortunately, the whole process had been guaranteed by the company, so the complete waterproof layer of the entire structure was redone at their cost. This new and unanticipated work was a very messy one, for it involved sandblasting the ferrous cement surface of 4,000 square meters to remove all traces of the old primer. It also delayed the work on the inner skin for some time. As soon as the sandblasting team left, the waterproofing team took over. A layer of transparent primer had to be painted onto a clean surface. Two solutions were mixed on the spot and applied within 15 minutes. A fleece was soaked in the remaining mixture and laid flat on the spot. The edges had to be trimmed accurately. A final coat of paint sealed the outer skin for hopefully a very long time. In 1998, the interior of the petals began to take shape. The entrance corridors were clad with red agra stone, the floor with granite slabs. The egg-shaped inner spaces were later painted in a single color from top to bottom. The roundness of these spaces was then punctuated only by the pure white of the marble floor. Each of the twelve petals was named according to the twelve attributes given by the mother. The first eight are attitudes to the divine and the last four towards humanity. Taken all together, these are the qualities of an integral human being. Each attribute had a particular color given by the mother and based on this, the color of each room was chosen. The result of research into the meaning behind each of the attributes gave inspiration for the window design, the shields. The white colored shields are double layered and curve inwards. Both layers consist of a sheet of translucent fiberglass. The inner layer has cutouts of various sizes, creating a magical play of light and shadow emphasized by its mirror image in the glass door. Underneath the sphere, a water tank was constructed in 1991 to catch the heavy monsoon rains. This bottom tank joins the lower petal foundations. It was then covered with a large concrete slab, on top of which sits a lotus pond measuring seven meters across. The 216 marble slabs, shaped like flower petals, are arranged in nine overlapping concentric circles. The ray of sun having passed through the inner chamber, travels downward through the center of the staircase and falls upon the center of the lotus pond.
the sound of the stone cutting saws has been the dominant sound for some months near the service entrance to the Matrimandir. Giant blades cut into 15 centimeter thick granite slabs. Cutting and moving the many tons of stones around is a major undertaking. There are 12 pathways, four of which lead into the sphere by the staircases, and eight of which lead to the lotus pool underneath. In all, there will be a few thousand meters of pathways in the future gardens, all of which will be clad in a combination of granite slabs and red sandstone, including the road which rings the oval. At the beginning of 2006, 36 years after the laying of the foundation stone, the Matrimandia team could foresee that they would be able to complete the structure within the year 2007. There are still a number of things that need to be done. On the inside, the ramps and the inner skin needs to be finished. All the technical questions uh, regarding both of these jobs have been finalized and it's just a question of getting the material and getting the work done. On the outside, the old heliostat has to be replaced by a newer version, which is ready. And of course the 12 petals have to be finished. There is uh, not much to be done. It's the paintwork has to be uh, completed and um, there is some problems with the ventilation. As, as they are today, but these things can be modified and it's not a very big job. The large discs which will be over each of the four entrances, uh, these are four meter wide discs, are still under fabrication. Also still underway is the fabrication of the shield which is just behind them, which is beside the entrances above and below. We are using the same process which was used to make the golden tiles for the big discs on Matramandir. After years of experimenting with different materials such as fiberglass, reinforced plastic and coloured glass, the decision was to go for a flame retardant translucent fiberglass fabric imported from France. The 800 prefabricated triangular elements of the inner skin composed of white powder coated aluminium frames over which a translucent sheet of this glass-based fabric is stretched, were prepared in the workshop. The triangles were fitted in place after the cement beams of the spherical shell of Matramandia had been painted and the security nets in the upper rows installed. Behind the panels, about 1,300 LED lights were installed for lighting the inside of the sphere at night. A combination of three different diodes is needed to get the exact soft golden pink glow that the mother had wanted. Completing the ramps would take several months. In the meantime, a temporary pipe and plank staircase was built from the second level right up to the chamber door. Finally, the ramps could be fitted with their final surfacing and glass parapets. The floor of the ramps is made of aluminium honeycomb panels. They're extremely lightweight and normally used in aeroplanes.
The aluminium channels which hold these parapets were manufactured and installed. The glass for the railing was manufactured and bent. Then the handrail was fitted on top giving stability and rigidity. In this way, as the work has advanced, the soul of Auroville has gradually become more and more manifest. Jai Ta. 